Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to say a few words of welcome to everyone who's joined us on this frigid evening uh, to commemorate or to mark the 30th anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The actual date is November 20th, uh, but uh, we chose this date because it was the date we could bring together the wonderful panel that we'll have, um, that, that we'll have uh, for you this evening. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Mary Bassett, and I am the director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. I um, moved to Boston in January uh, and uh, previously worked as the New York City Health Commissioner, so academia is a new place for me. Uh, and so is the whole idea of human rights. I've worked my whole uh, working life on issues related to social justice. And I wondered, of course I'd heard of the Universal Declaration uh, of Human Rights, which uh, we celebrated 70 years last year. Um, but I really hadn't heard of much else. And the reason is that the U.S. is party to so few of these uh, conventions and covenants. Uh, which is a source of um, enduring alarm to me, um, but also uh, is bad for the rights of people in this country and the rights of, uh, 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 of people everywhere, uh, because the United States is such a powerful country. Uh, the uh, U.S. now has the distinction, as I'm sure others will mention, of being the only me member state which is not party to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, the Convention's only 30 years old, so it really uh, reflects the growing recognition that children deserve special protections, one that I think we all understand, and one that we see increasingly uh, under threat at our own southern border. So these issues really matter. They're not just a matter of signing pieces of paper, uh, but um, they are a matter of ensuring that people have access not only to the rights protected under our Constitution, but to rights that are protected by our global government represented by the United Nations. So I'm just going to welcome you here and then turn it over to Jackie Baba, who has, uh, on behalf of FXB, has. Uh, has agreed to be our host this evening and to uh, chair the panel. Uh, and I'm going to let her introduce the two panelists that we have joining us, one of whom will talk about the whole trajectory, because getting a concept like a con Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, signed and ratified is a long process. And uh, I think Susan's going to talk mostly to that. And then about our, the current uh, uh, implications for the U.S. as the sole member state that has not party to this convention will be addressed by Lee. But I'm preempting Jackie's role. Uh, Jackie Baba is the Director for Research at the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights. And I would be remiss if I didn't explain to you that the center had a founding gift uh, from uh, Albina dubois rouvray whose son tragically died in a helicopter accident in, at the age of just 24. The center's been around for 25 years and was established by uh, a, her generous uh, gift, which she made in memory of her son, but also to focus particularly on the need to protect vulnerable children in vulnerable situations. So this not only is a day in which we acknowledge uh, the 30th anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but also reiterate the longstanding commitment of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights to the protection of children everywhere. So with that, let me turn it over to Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, and again, uh, on behalf of um, the FXB Center and the School of Public Health, um, welcome to all of you. Um, as Mary said, uh, 
We've had 30 years of um, a convention on the rights of the child, so you can either see that just as a, a, a very short period of time and just an indication that we're at the beginning of something, or you can see that as quite a long time for which we should have something to show. And I think that anniversaries always provide us with this opportunity of both looking back and looking forward. Um, you know, celebrating an event, but also setting ourselves uh, target standards for, for doing better uh, moving forward. And I think that is exactly what the purpose of, of today's um, event is. So, um, as you'll hear, it's been quite a long journey. And I think some of the questions that we have in our minds as we embark on this discussion are why did we need to have a convention on the rights of the child? After all, uh, we have a universal declaration on human rights. We have international covenants on a whole range of human rights. So why was it necessary to have something specifically about children? After all, ch children are human beings. They're covered by the international treaty. So why something special? Um, second question, um, why was this convention uh, signed so fast? Why has it been so widely ratified? Why is there, as Mary rightly said, only one uh, country, only one member state of the United Nations that has not ratified this? The only convention for which you can say that. Why? What's particular about it? Um, what, what explains that? And third, and perhaps most important, has the convention made a difference? Does it make any difference whether you sign on to human rights conventions or not? Are they just, as some realists argue, just pieces of paper that countries kind of ratify just to look good in the international arena, but actually don't really pay attention to? Or do they have consequences? And I think from an advocate's point of view, and I think everybody probably in this room and certainly all of us up here consider ourselves advocates, are human rights conventions useful as tools? How can we use them and what difference do, do they make? So the speakers that we have this evening um, will in different ways illuminate this question. Uh, one of them is an expert on the convention and has been a, a, a leading, maybe the leading f figure in child protection in the international arena. And the other person is a leading civil rights lawyer in the one country that has not ratified the CRC. And so he probably doesn't know very much about it because, it, <laughs> <laughs> because he doesn't Guilty. need to know about Guilty. it. Guilty. Um, so in our minds is the question, would the US be different if it had ratified the convention? That's a sort of subtext for, for some of us. And in the meantime, let's hear what the US is doing in some of the child rights related issues that are most pressing at the moment. But this is, I'm getting ahead of myself, we'll have this discussion. Let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Susan Bissell, who, as I say, is really a, if not the global leader in child protection. I think it's fair to say that she put the issue of child protection on the global map like no one else. And she did so in many capacities. First of all, as somebody who spent a quarter of a century, a long time, working for UNICEF in a whole range of different capacities, in a whole range of different places. So she has worked in many, many countries in South Asia in particular, but she's also worked at the Innocenti Center, which is UNICEF's research center in Florence. She's worked in New York. And finally, at the end of her career with UNICEF, she rose to be the chief of child protection of UNICEF, so the spokesperson for UNICEF's uh, policies on child protection. And as I must say, as somebody, as a consumer, if you like, of child protection policies, it was very remarkable to see the impact that she had uh, in pushing this sort of neglected field, children are neglected anyway, and child protection is neglected within UNICEF. So putting, pushing this doubly neglected field forward, um, both as someone who really believed in the value of evidence and research, which of course those who are sitting in university really care about, but also who saw 
the value of really making alliances with member states of the UN. And so she had this amazing capacity to bring countries and you know, ministers and leaders from countries on board on this project. So it's really uh, very um, instructive. After she, um, um, sort of after some years of, of, of being the, the chief of child protection, uh, Dr. Bissell then went on to found and to direct um, the globe, something called the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children and, and a fund associated with it. And again, she brought the same combination of evidence-based um, knowledge extraordinary networking abilities and a visionary leadership to really build this, again, very difficult challenge of really getting states, getting politicians to think about this epidemic of violence against children. So um, I really think we're very lucky to have her with us this evening, but also to have her now as a senior fellow at the FXB Center. Not surprisingly, she's received many awards, including the Dr. Jean Meyer Global Citizenship Award from Tufts University, and I know there are some people from Tufts here, and the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, among, other, uh, among several awards she, she's received. She um, earned her PhD in public health and medical anthropology from the University of Melbourne in Australia, which for those of you who are HSPH students here, yeah, I should say, is clear proof that public health training equips you very well for global <laughs> leadership in the child protection field. So Susan, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much for inviting me for that kind invitation. And uh, um, I'm a little bit embarrassed, actually. I'm really just a normal Canadian. Um, <laughs> I always try to get that in at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> So, and also, I mean, uh, to the director and to you, Jackie, I'm just thrilled to be here with, with you at the FXB Center and, and in Boston, and I look forward to the year ahead, um, learning from you, being inspired by you, and ho hopefully it's a two-way. Um, so I, I'm not gonna read a text, but I made myself a few notes just to uh, share a few things with you about where this convention came from, and I'm gonna be slightly anecdotal here because I think it'll make it a bit more interesting. So, uh, for starters, um, while the convention is 30 years old um, on the 20th of November, um, I actually arrived in New York as an intern at UNICEF in 1987, so tail end of the drafting and ratification, and I, I think I said this to you, Jackie, but I became the chief photocopier in residence <laughs> for the drafting committee, um, <laughs> but what a great introduction to this transition that was about to happen and not just within UNICEF, but really, I would say, for the world's children. And, and you caught me on a really good day because I'm going to be very upbeat about the convention and its anniversary <laughs> and the way forward, and, and then I will probably get bookends over here. So, um, But anyway, so, so that final drafting process um, was really the culmination of um, 10 years of work, and you might say that's a long time, and Liz, I'm sure you would agree with me, Liz, who's also been was given in the UN, 10 years isn't that long to get a really big thing done, especially when you're negotiating a text, which is very complex, and I'll get into that complexity in a minute. And who had this brilliant idea for this um, Convention on the Rights of the Child was actually a jurist from Poland. His name is Adam Lopatka. He's written a beautiful little book of poetry about childhood, which is kind of bizarre when you think about here's this judge and everything, but I urge you to look him up. Um, What's interesting, and I, this is anecdotal, but I, I still have questions today from people about whether children really have rights. And the second question I get a lot is, where is this convention happening? Uh, and it's not a meeting, it's an <laughs> international treaty. There is no <laughs> convention on children's rights. I'll, I'm sure there are many. But, but many adults even today um, see children as dependents, um, think that they lack agency, um, they don't vote. They're seen as property in many parts of the world, or as, uh, to quote the former Deputy Secretary General of the Council of Europe, they're mini adults. So as you said, they should, they have the rights that adults have, so. Um, or not persons with particular standing um, because they're under the age of 18. And everything I just said is the reasons why the convention is such a brilliant addition to our, um, our, our, our tool chest, if you will, of, of conventions and standards. This is the first convention that covers economic, social, political, and cultural rights. This is a historic first. 
Um, and there are four general principles of this convention. And you know, if you don't want to read the rest of it, just read two things, the general principles of this convention and its general measures of implementation. That'll take you 10 minutes and you'll really get in, you know, the essence of this thing. But the general principles, and I think they're really relevant, so relevant to your work, yeah. which are the right to survival, non-discrimination, the best interests of children are supposed to prevail in decision making, and ch children are to participate in decisions that affect them according to their evolving capacity. So if someone says, well, well okay, a four-year-old is supposed to participate, certain things they might be able to weigh in on, and maybe we're really talking about eight-year-olds or 12-year-olds or so, but the convention began to unpack this um, for, the f for the first time. The convention was drafted by a working group, a committee of governments, non-government organizations, or if you call them civil society, UN agencies and others. Um, and I think um, I wanna just disclose here that there was resistance from UNICEF for the first five or six years. So by the time I got it to New York from Toronto, um, they, there was a little bit of a, okay, maybe we should get involved. And this was in part a fear of mission creep for UNICEF, which had focused very heavily on health and education and water and sanitation and, and what we, many of us have come to think of like the basics. Um, a human rights agenda might draw UNICEF from, from that focus and other basic services into a more complex set of is issues such as those that comprise the protection of children. And I think that, <laughs> that fear came true, um, <laughs> uh, and we'll come back to that in a minute, but that's, um, I wouldn't call it mission creep, I'd call it evolution. Right. A lot of the good stuff's done in health now, a lot more kids are immunized, a lot more kids are in school, et cetera. I'm not saying the agenda's finished, uh, but, uh, but certainly new issues have emerged and are continuing to emerge. So as I said, it took 10 years to reach agreement on the historic text, and I really don't think that was such a long time. Of course, I only came in at the last two years, so it seemed pretty swift to me. Um, at that time, and I already had a personal um, interest in, it wasn't even called child protection, it was called um, children in especially difficult circumstances, but I had an interest in children in war and trafficking and child labor, and, and these are all the things that this convention began to unpack and look at. And so uh, for you know people e much more senior to me that had been working on these things, that children's protection was in a treaty, an international treaty for the first time, legitimately, and you mentioned this, Jackie, created opportunities for advocacy and action in the lives of children around the world. So this isn't like a convention for UNICEF, this is a convention of the United Nations. Um, and it still is a very, very powerful tool for advocacy. So I'll just give you a few facts drawn from the convention, and I apologize for those of you that have studied this um, in even greater depth, but children are defined as those under the age of 18. Um, there are articles in the convention about child labor, trafficking, children in war, in addition to health, education, intercountry adoption, you name it, pretty much everything is in there except three things which have come into optional protocols later. Um, on, the, on the latter, the issue of intercountry adoption, this is one of the most fascinating parts of the convention because it's the only part of the convention on the rights of the child that is actually a subject of private international law as well. So the convention on the rights of the child is public international law and intercountry adoption is also covered by public or private international law. If anybody wants to do a paper on this, there isn't one. <laughs> so this is an area that's ripe for work. Um, it's fascinating and we can talk about it more at another time if you want. But anyway, that, that one's, I, I keep mentioning it everywhere I go, law firms and I just can't get anybody to, to take it up. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the whole issue of child participation features prominently in this convention in two ways. Um, Children are, according to, the, to Article 12, to have a voice in matters that affect them. And that's not just, um, it's not like a soft article of the convention because there's an A and B there. And one relates to legal and administrative procedures. And I think for Lee, for your work, and I've met children whose parents have been deported and they said, well, no one asked me what I thought about this administrative or legal procedure. So, so I think there are some important things there. The convention mentions the right to a name and a nationality. Um, this has uh, got massive relevance right now in 
Syria in the detention camps where there are children of um, former ISIS fighters or children born of rape in the war who are basically stateless and nationalityless and the very sad situation there. Now, um, Article 4 of the Convention calls upon state parties to allocate resources to realize the rights of children domestically and to ask for international assistance. This is a really important thing in terms of like how powerful is this convention? Is it just a, a wish list of, of really good things for children? And, and, and this notion of you must allocate resources is very relevant and practical, although it's also, as I will tell you later, a bit of an escape clause on many things. Um, now, I mentioned that the convention pretty much covered everything, and the proof to me that the convention is a live, valuable, evolving document is that some things were missed. And those things were missed because they couldn't reach consensus on them. One issue that developed into an optional protocol on the sale of children, child prostitution and pornography um, uh, emerged, I don't want to get the date wrong, but some time after the convention was ratified. So there's now an optional protocol on that. And I'm happy to report that the US has ratified that optional protocol. And I was part of drafting the guidelines for reporting on that. And we made them sufficiently broad that even if you hadn't ratified the convention and you reported on that optional protocol, we'd get a pretty good glimpse of what was going on in your country. And the US's report is really good. Um, a second optional protocol on children in war, children in armed conflict. And that was because there couldn't reach a be agreement when the convention was drafted, so that's the second one. And a couple of years ago, <laughs> there's a, another protocol, which I don't know how much traction it's really going to get, but, um, and it's on, on an individual complaints mechanism for children. So if children exhaust local remedies, state remedies, uh, no, no, provincial, I won't use the US, but um, provincial re remedies and then national remedies, and they still don't, it doesn't work out, they can go to the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Um, there's another one of those for the uh, for CEDAW, for the Convention on the Rights of Women, and there haven't been any individual complaints, so I'm not sure it's going to be used, but it, maybe it's symbolic. Um, so I, I would argue, or I do argue, that the Convention forces us or allows or encourages us to see children in a different way, as human beings in and of themselves with particular rights. Um, and what I studied actually partly when I was in Florence, but um, is that what seems to have happened is that the Convention on the Rights of the Child and its adoption and ratification um, triggered a process of social change. And if for no other reason, uh, this is really important. Um, and we saw, we saw that the Convention had a relationship to national, state, and provincial legislation, and that's where this change began to be triggered. This is especially true when we look at domestic law reform processes that involve public discourse and debate. So it's not, and I'm, I was in Bangladesh at the time when, um, when they ratified the convention and they needed to do some law reform and asked us at UNICEF to hire a consultant who sat in a room and drafted a whole bunch of legislation. And, and that really wasn't the way it, it, it's meant to be if you're going to have the kind of social change you need. Um, when citizens, including young people themselves, discuss issues and give voice to matters affecting children, with a view to possibly codifying them, then things do start to change. And I want to use two examples. The first is Sweden. I know we always use Sweden as an example, but it's a really good one. <laughs> Bernie Sanders, right? <laughs> Sweden. Um, uh, but there's a lot of, um, what happened there was there was a movement internally, civil society led primarily, Sweden of course ratified very quickly, uh, public discussion about ending corporal punishment against children. Now. This is curious, I think, but it took 30 years for Sweden to com completely eradicate corporal punishment. Um, and so it's, it's, that's just in the last few years. But there were lots of public debates. There, were, um, there was consultation with children during this period. And basically, over the course of a generation, the practice of beating, berating, and degrading children to punish them ended. Um, now, you could say, is that because of the convention? I don't know. I, we think there was a relationship, but cause and effect would be a little bit difficult to prove. <laughs> what we do know is that public and dialogue informed law reform is crucial. Um, and then I think what's also interesting, so you know, every country has room for improvement. It was only last year that Sweden completely domesticated the Convention on the Rights of the Child into its national legislation. So things take time. These things do take time, to your point, I think. The second example I want to use is India, and I don't know if anybody remembers the 2012 gang rapes on that bus. 
So um, now, I mean, sexual violence isn't new or exclusive to India, but this particular case in New Delhi, and I lived there for five years after Bangladesh, and it, it, there was never been so much national outrage about the rape of this, this girl. And this, uh, I think one of the pieces of evidence that this was powerful was that there was a, something called the Verma Commission was set up to quickly look at what happened. And within 30 days, I think it was, um, they came out with their findings. And so this is like a rapid for India. This was a ma an amazing turnaround. Um, has sexual violence ended in India? No. Um, and of course, this abhorrent form of violence continues, including across college campuses in the US and around the world. But I would argue that there is some kind of process of social change happening. Um, I mean, no, we all cite the Me Too movement, but you know, where you have public conversation, where you have students demonstrating, where you have things happening um, publicly. Um, and I think this underscores for the um, FXB students I met, but the social determinants of health incomes um, are particularly relevant in, in child protection work. So go on those social determinants <laughs> in your papers. Um, I want to quickly just tell you a little bit about the reporting process because that's evolved over 30 years too and it's not a good trend. Um, so a, a committee on the rights of the child was established to meet twice a year to receive submissions from parties to the convention. So once you ratify, you report after two years and then every five years. Then that's all fine. Um, the committee was 10 people. They're experts nominated by their governments from around the world and then they sit for, I, I can't remember, I think it's a two year period, there's a chair and a vice chair. Over the last few years, given the volume of work, okay, we have every country ratifying the convention or the optional protocols, they're swamped. Oh, by the way, they're not paid, they're volunteer uh, experts. And so they decided the committee would meet four times a year and have 18 people instead of the original. Um, and uh, they review the reports of member states this is how the process works. So your member state, and if, if we've evolved from hire a consultant to write the report, you've actually got a committee within the government completing this report. There's a shadow report from civil society. If there's another organization, a human rights watch or a UNICEF or a, anybody else there, they can submit reports too. The government goes to Geneva and they have a constructive dialogue with this committee. And then um, the committee offers in writing what are called concluding observations. And these are things that they think the state can do better. And against the concluding observations, the state party will be reviewed again. So this is really different than, for example, Security Council Resolution 1612, right? Which is naming and shaming. It's getting parties to conflict on a list at the UN. Secretary General publishes it. It's really bad to be on that list. This is really different. This is meant to be helping you to improve the situation of children in your country. Now, what's worrying me and a, and a lot of people right now is that two things, and they're, I think they're big and I think they go along with the political trends we're seeing around the world right now. Member states lobbied so hard that they no longer have to report on the whole convention. They can pick and choose what they want to report on and they don't have to report on the general measures of implementation, which we made sufficiently broad so we would get everything. Uh, and so now they can just, it's more or less laissez-faire. Mm -hmm. Worrying trend number one. And even worse, in my, in my opinion, is that, and this debate's been going on for a while, but it's shifting in the wrong direction, and that is that there will be one treaty body for reporting on all human rights conventions. And then I think we can say goodbye to kids. Wow. Um, and, and so watch this space. Um, the outgoing head of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, who is a bit of a not so positive person anyway, but I had lunch with her a few months ago and she just said, I mean, we're going backwards on this stuff. So, um, so just in conclusion, um, uh, I wanna make a couple comments about children's rights, rhetoric and reality. Um, it's true, and people will say, okay, well, you got the best laws on the books, but if you don't implement them and have programs and a holistic approach, it's not very effective. Okay, that's true, but you still need the legal framework. Um, you need something to hang it on. You need some accountability. Um, and I, I would say that the gaps have less to do with what the laws are on paper than with the political will and the financial and human resources to make change happen. And I think it's gonna be such a good segue to you, Lee, in terms of the political will question. Um, laws have to be resourced and implemented. And I know that's very simple to say, um, but we have so many good examples. I hope we can get to some of the constructive 
sort of yeah examples of, of where the convention has been wrestled with and resourced and, and implemented. Um, I, I where I see the biggest omission and, and the greatest inaction right now um, are places, and these aren't like the poorest countries in the world, but are places. I, this is very. I mean, I'm leading you so swiftly into you into your comments. But I see the biggest omission and inaction in places, even with functioning democracies, where the social construction of childhood or childhoods um, is stuck. That's me. Thank you. Susan, thank you very much. That was, as always, really thoughtful and. Um, your insights kind of as an insider as well as your purview uh, more broadly really really extremely helpful so thank you very much for those comments um, before I introduce Lee I, I just wanted to ask you one or two questions if I may so the first question really goes back to one of your early comments about UNICEF and UNICEF's attitude to the CRC which actually was interesting and for me surprising to hear would you say that UNICEF now I mean UNICEF is seen as as kind of you know the mission of UNICEF really revolves revolves around implementing um, the obligations uh, set out in the CRC. Would you see um, UNICEF now as having really fully adopted the CRC and all parts of it, and in particular, the child protection agenda? Because my sense, as someone who has worked quite a lot with UNICEF, but not from the inside, is that there is still perhaps a sort of hierarchy of what's really important, what's really mainstream, what gets the kind of lion's share of the funding, and what is, um, to be sure, relevant, but not as central. I feel that battle is still kind of, if not raging, needs to be addressed. I just wondered what your views about that were. Uh, you're spot on. I mean, <laughs> I think it's two steps forward, one step back. Um, and I think there there is still a hierarchy. And you know, the, I once wrote a paper that never got published, which was called "Child Survival for What," and it, it was all in favor of child survival. But if you're going to survive and end up in a brothel or trafficked or and I'm, again, I'm, it's not to, but it is to say, uh, the perception is still that it's nice to do at the end, or it must be done in a humanitarian situation, but. It's not bread and butter. And I, 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 I mean, I completely disagree with that. And I think the sustainable development goals and the new agenda that's out there suggest that it, we're looking at um, holistic approaches. Uh, you know, it's a buzzword, but taking the whole child. And, and this is another thing we wrote about, which was Tony Lake, when he was the head of UNICEF, brought equity into, into UNICEF. Um, and um, equity is really important. And I, Human rights activists would say equity is about human rights, so no problem. But we also say it's equity in the whole child. It's not equity in the under fives or you know equity in the primary school going age children. So, um, but it is a battle. I think it'll continue to be a battle. We're, we had a great conversation uh, last night here about um, we talk to ourselves, and we and I I mean child protection people. I think the child rights community. We're often with ourselves. I'm, I'm chairing a thing in Geneva next week, which is like all people who are already on board. So, you know, and, and we, I think what we don't do well is communicate what this stuff is in a, a simpler way. And I don't mean simplistic, but um, there's a lot of jargon and, and there's a lot of, uh, uh, I think, pushback from, from the mainstream, certainly health and education. I, I anecdotally, when I was trying to set the partnership, I was still within UNICEF, but you know I couldn't get my own health colleagues to talk to me, and here we were saying violence is a public health problem. So we did get WHO, but that was more because they wanted to move the fund over to WHO. So, but anyway, it's um it's a it's a battle, and I think we're going a little <coughs> bit backwards. I really do, and I think we just have to keep keep fighting the good fight. Um, last question, second and last question, is you mentioned, this is maybe a little bit technical, but you mentioned the optional protocol which gives children the right to take a case. And interesting to hear you be somewhat skeptical, I think maybe because I'm a lawyer, I was actually extremely excited about that. Also because in many contexts, this has been actually an enormously important tool. As I always tell my students, it, it and I don't know, you know, if, if Lee has the same view, I mean, it gives an individual um, 
a platform in international law, which is very unusual. You know, an individual child, no doubt with a good advocate, has a possibility of taking their country to um, to court and actually challenging the country's failure to enforce or or implement whatever right it is. So, um, you know, it, I think it the jury's out, of course, but I think it often takes a while. If you take the European Convention on Human Rights, it took a long time for that kind of optional protocol procedure to really kick in, but now it's, it's a central part of human rights activism, I would say, in Europe, I mean, including for immigrant rights people. You know, the European Court of Human Rights is very much part of the debate about what countries are and aren't doing. So, um, you know, I think um, this it's maybe crystal ball gazing, but I, I think there really is scope for building on that opportunity and saying to children and to their advocates, we have to use this as much as we can in countries which have ratified the optional protocol because uh, at the end of the day, there is nothing like a case for forcing a country to really rethink some of its, its most deep-seated prejudices. And I would advocate for using it as a threat because my concern is, I mean, a threat to, yeah, What's supposed to happen are these um, these I intermediary steps, and so one of the general measures of the Convention on the Rights of the Child is the establishment of an independent human rights institution for children in country. So there's got to be a first port of call, and I just I would hate to see resources diverted, you know, from establishing those institutions and resourcing them for a single case. Although the case might you know prove to be relevant to many children in that country, I would argue the same would happen if the ombuds picked it up and dealt with it nationally. So that, that's just my fear, and mm -hmm. that some of these high profile cases would, you know, they might splash in the, in the press and everything else and then fizzle away and we don't get the systemic change that we need for children. But I don't disagree with you. I, I, I do think it could be useful to say, well, if you don't do this, we're go going to do this. But there aren't very many children who are gonna be able to access that kind of a mechanism. And if I just think about the gazillions of child laborers I've met around the world, they're never gonna, see their cases picked up, you know, the systemic solutions for them are going to happen locally and nationally. Can I ask a question? Or yes, please. I mean, so is there, is there a mechanism for bringing what we call here like a class action? Because you're saying not getting at the systemic problems, would it have to be individual lawsuits by individual children saying, or could they group together like we do in the U.S. to seek systemic change, or is it that doesn't have that mechanism? You know, I'm not 100% sure, but my suspicion mm -hmm. is it could. But it's been the whole thing is untested. It's right. really fresh, so okay. I think that's a great, a great uh, I possibility. I think normally what happens in international human rights litigation is that it is an individual who brings right. the case. But of course, it is something like the ACLU that is actually bringing the case, deciding which is the case, which is the best case to lead with. So it is a product of a campaign, but it's not as if you add on another hundred parties. Yeah. It's, it's a different okay. mechanism. But this, the case is, is actually, a, a, in a way, yeah. often a, a kind of a symbolic That's case. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm now delighted to introduce our, our second speaker, who is Lee Gellant. Lee is a very well-known American civil rights lawyer. And for the last two years at least, he's been at the helm of, I would say, most of the really important immigrant rights litigation in this country. So anybody who follows um, the news on the kind of what you might call the war against immigrants that this, that this um, administration is waging and looking at the fight back will have come across Lee, Lee's name. Um, he, he's argued some of the most high profile cases, uh, including the very first case that happened soon after the Trump administration was in office uh, and instituted its uh, infamous uh, so-called Muslim ban, the ban on people from certain Muslim countries traveling to the US. And Lee was a lawyer who <laughs> argued in favor of a na nationwide injunction that actually was implemented the day after the ban was enacted. So it's kind of wonderful victory and there have been many like that to follow. So it's, if for anybody who's working in this field, we know that the political situation is so dire and of course the administration's policies have been so toxic and so vindictive that the law has been one of the key bulwarks in the battle to restrain evil, <laughs> in the battle to protect uh, 
uh, immigrants and their rights from real decimation. And uh, it's, it's been a complicated set of battles, and um, you know, the, 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 the scorecard isn't, isn't all on one side, but I think without the ACLU and without people like Lee Gallant working there, we would be, and, and the whole immigrant rights community would be in a much less, uh, much less, um, even, even worse, much worse position than we are now. So not surprisingly, um, uh, Lee's been recognized uh, in, in multiple contexts. He's, he's uh, considered one of uh, the US's 500 leading lawyers, which is a distinction that very few non-corporate lawyers, or I should say public interest attorneys get. Um, he's received many awards, and he's spoken everywhere. Um, he, he's an adjunct professor at Columbia. He's also taught at Yale, and he's, as I say, he's spoken um, to the NAACP's National Convention. He's spoken at West Point. He's spoken to every major law uh, school in the country. But most importantly, I think he, his work really speaks to the sense of outrage. Uh, but his work is more tempered and more legally focused, but it speaks to that sense of outrage that I think s so many constituencies have felt as we hurtle towards a, a more and more fascistic um, approach to, to, to non-citizens or to immigrants. So Lee, thank you so much for the work that you do, and thank you for coming here this evening. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, what I thought I would do is talk about one case that I think, it, it, for me, it's the family separation practice. And for me, and I've said this publicly before, is this? Um, it's the worst thing I have seen in my 25 plus years doing this work. Um, give you a sense, because I think there's, a, there's things that are really not hitting the media, uh, especially recently about the family separation practice. Talk about that case and maybe leave for a question and answer some of the other Trump administration policies that are affecting children, including a lot of the asylum bans, which are leaving families either with no opportunity to seek asylum or waiting in very dangerous places in Mexico to seek asylum and talk about the impact that's having on families and in particular children, as well as some of the detention policies, the, the Trump administration's attempt to have indefinite detention of children to keep them in conditions that are, are horrendous. Um, but I thought maybe at the question and answer, anybody who's interested in talking about that, we can do that, but I, I thought maybe I would just focus on the family separation practice. Um, so in the fall of 2017, we began hearing that children were, be, were being taken away from their parents when they came to the U.S. border, the southern border, uh, most of whom were asylum seekers. But we really weren't sure what was going on. And one of the things that happened is that the administration said publicly, you know, famously on CNN, um, former Secretary Kelly said, we're thinking about a family separation practice, but we haven't yet decided to do it. And I think everyone sort of went to sleep on it. But we were hearing rumblings on the ground throughout the fall and over the holidays of 2017 that families were indeed being separated. By January of 2018, it became clear that families were being separated. The people on the ground were reporting that, that families were being separated. And so we decided we would bring a legal action and began developing a legal action. But we also needed to find the parents. It was very difficult. In February, I got a call that there was a woman from the Congo who was in a detention center in San Diego on the border, uh, San Diego, Tijuana, who had had her child taken. So I went out to see her. And she described what had happened to her. She had escaped the Congo, fearing for her life with her then six-year-old daughter, made it to the US after a journey of three or four months. Some of you may have seen her picture with her daughter. The New York Times did a Sunday magazine cover story about the ACLU, and she was the, the picture on the cover with holding her daughter. Um, you know, her, a horrendous journey, four months, walking barefoot hundreds of miles, eating out of garbage cans, begging for food, finally made it to the US border, and went to a port of entry and asked, can I apply for asylum with my daughter? Uh, and I mentioned that she went to a port of entry 
and legally sought entry because one of the narratives coming out of the administration at the time was you don't want your child taken, don't cross the border illegally. Now, obviously, we thought, well, you can't take the child even if the people do cross illegally. But this woman, who ended up being the name plaintiff in our case, Miss L, we have never publicly identified her. She goes by Miss L, um, ended up being the name plaintiff. So she described how she had come in. They put her in sort of makeshift detention for four days with her daughter. And then one day, they brought her and her daughter to an office and they separated them into separate rooms. They handcuffed the, the mother and told her she was gonna go to an adult detention center. And she heard her child screaming, mommy, don't let them take me away, don't let them take me away. They took the daughter away. They didn't tell the mother where she was going for four days. They finally told her she was in Chicago, which of course she was from a little village in the Congo, meant nothing to her. By the time I saw her, she had barely eaten, barely slept, it had been four months. She had talked to her daughter periodically, maybe once every 10 days, very briefly. Her daughter had celebrated her seventh birthday by herself in Chicago. And we decided that we would bring a lawsuit immediately on her behalf and not wait till we could get the national class action developed because that would take another couple of weeks. And so we went to court and the government said, well, she didn't have all her papers with her you know, showing that it was her biological daughter. And we said, well, of course not. It took her four months to get here. And of course, she didn't have anything by the time she got here. And we said, but she looks identical to the daughter. The little girl was screaming, mommy, don't let them take me away. You can't seriously believe she's a trafficker. And then the judge ultimately just cut through it all and said, have you offered the mother a DNA test? This is the first the mother's hearing that you don't think she's the biological mother. The government said no. They had to give them a, her a DNA test. Of course, she was the biological mother. She got reunited, but by that time, it was clear to us that there were hundreds of parents who had been separated, so we brought the national class action a few weeks later, and by the time we stood up in court, the New York Times had broken that there were 700 families, they believed, who had been separated, and that was May of 2018. The judge ultimately issued a nationwide injunction saying, that the policy of separating children had to stop and that all the families who had been separated needed to be reunited and it turned out that there were 2,800 families, far more than the few hundred we thought, that many of them were just babies, some five months old, six months old, toddlers. And we decided, you know, we said to the judge, this needs to happen immediately. And so we said we were proposing 30 days to get all 2,800 families back with their parents and 14 days for children under five. And I think this goes to a little bit of what your comment was about sort of where do you draw the line between ages. You know, and we could not get the medical community to say definitively where they would draw the line. A lot of them sort of were willing to say off the record, you know, under five seems maybe the right place. And ultimately, we just decided we didn't want to leave it to the government to have their choice of who to try and reunite first within the 30 days. We knew we couldn't get them all reunited within two weeks, so we chose two weeks to get the children under five reunited. Of course, does everyone know who Colbert is? I assume people know, of course. Uh, we, you know, a few weeks later, Colbert was talking about it. That's, you know, sort of, we'll talk a little about how it sort of ended up permeating the whole, the, you know, the, the national media, the regular media, the joke media, you know. Um, he said, oh yeah, of course, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, they can take care of themselves. There's no reason the ACLU needed to worry about the, you know, but we had to try and figure out some place to draw the line to get those kids two weeks. So the government missed the two-week deadline. It turned out they really hadn't kept track of the parents and children. They missed the two-week deadline, then they missed the 30-day deadline. And one of the reasons they missed the 30-day deadline is because it turned out that 471 of the parents of the 2,800 had been deported without their children and were now out of the country and their children were still in the country. And the government said, well, we have no obligation to find the parents. So we said, we will find them and we will get NGOs to help us and a law firm. And so it took us approximately a year to find every one of the parents. We ultimately found them and gave them all the opportunity to reunite with their children. And I say opportunity because some of the parents chose not to reunite with their children they just decided it was too dangerous to bring their children back to Central America, and that is principally the children who were at gang level age, 
and would have, it would have basically been a death sentence if they brought them back. We're trying to get those parents the opportunity to come back to the U.S. because they were misled into giving up their asylum hearings. A lot of them were told, if you want to get your child back, just give up your case, which is, of course, what the government wanted, and said your child will be on the plane with you. When they got on the plane, the plane took off. The child wasn't there. And so the child ended up being in the U.S. And so that took an enormous amount of time, the 2800. During that year, though, there was an HHS internal report that revealed that there were hundreds, if not potentially well over a thousand families who had been separated before the 2800, who the government never told us about, the court, Congress, or the public. We went back to court. The government said, well, those children had been given away to sponsors before the injunction. We don't think we have an obligation to tell you about them or find them. The court said, no, in this country, we're going to have an historical record that shows that we tried to find all these children. The government then said, we want two years to give the ACLU the list of these families, not to find the family, but give the list. Ultimately, the judge sided with us and said, they're going to have to give the list of names on a rolling basis within six months, which just ended a few weeks ago. It turned out that there were another 1,550 family separate, children separated and even younger than the prior set of children. And so now we're in the process. We just got that list of looking all over the world for these parents. A good percentage of them were deported without their children. Their children are still in the U.S. Um, and on top of that, I think that most people don't know that since the injunction in June of 2018, the government has actually continued to separate families. And the latest numbers we got this week were that 1,100 children have been separated since the court told them to stop. So now we're looking at about 5,500 children in total separated that we know of, at least that the government has told us about. And the government's rationale for separating them since the injunction is that the judge let them continue separating on an individual basis if they believe the parent was a danger to the child. And of course, the whole case, we have always said, if a parent is genuinely a danger to a child, you take the child away. That's standard child welfare practice in every state in the country. And what we expected to find when we got the data from the government is that there were 1,100 cases, I mean, obviously we were skeptical, but that there were 1,100 cases where the parent was genuinely believed to be a dangerous child. It turns out that they were separating if the parent had a nonviolent theft offense from 20 years ago, a disorderly conduct, a DUI offense, on and on and on, just using the pretext that the parent's criminal history made them a danger to the child. Under no circumstances would anybody have their child taken away under state law for these types of crimes, right? And it was just one after another. We are, so we are fighting that issue now in the court to get the court to lay down, hopefully we'll lay down a much stricter, stricter standard that abides by national child welfare standards and international welfare standards that say you don't take a child from their parent unless the parent is actually a danger to the child. Um, you know, the, but the numbers, I think, tell one part of the story. And, and, you know, they tell a big part of the story. But for me, I think it's ultimately been the, the individual cases. And I think, you know, one danger is that the numbers ultimately obscure and the abstract policy arguments ultimately obscure the human dimension. And a lot of the cases I think about may not even necessarily be the objectively worst individual cases I've seen. But there, I think there's just little acts of cruelty you know, there's one four-year-old four Honduran boy, um, and he needed glasses. And his parents were of modest means, but they were able to scrape together the money to get him glasses and to get him a glasses case. And the glasses case was the biggest thing in their life because they knew if he broke his glasses, they probably wouldn't be able to get him another pair of glasses. And they came to take him away, and fortunately, he was wearing his glasses case. And he was begging, and the mother was being, please don't take him away. They took him away, but the mother wasn't able to get the glasses case for him. So all day long, all the mother thinks about, can my little boy see? Are his glasses broken? Will they get him another pair of glasses? Will they find a place for him to keep his glasses safe? You know, it's just one thing like that after another. A father told us he was with his seven-year-old son, and he knew they were going to take the little boy away. And he just asked them, can I have 
a few seconds, just a few seconds to try as best I can to brace him for what's going to happen. No, they just came and screamed out, we're taking your son right in front of the son. The son is pleading with his father, tell me what's happening. Um, you know, another mother with an 18-month-old, they would not let the, the mother comfort. The, they, put, they made the mother put the child in a car seat, strap her, and the child is screaming. They would not let her comfort the child. She closes the door. The little baby is cranking her neck to see the, what the mother's going to get in the car, conditioned to seeing her mother walk around the car to get in the driver's seat. The car just pulls away. It's just one story after another where the, the children are literally begging not to be taken away. And sometimes the parents are begging and fighting. And sometimes, and what I feel is almost the worst thing, is the parents are just standing there still too afraid to talk. And what they've told me repeatedly is, I just didn't want them to treat my kid worse. So if I complained, I thought maybe they're going to treat them worse. So the parents could not, they didn't feel like they, they could fight back. Some parents just fought back as best they could, but they just ultimately ripped the child out of their, out of their arms. Um, you, you know, and so the, the trauma, I think we're going to hopefully get every one of these children reunified, but the trauma is obviously deep-seated and what the medical community and you, you know many of you probably know better than I do you know what we were told when we brought the case in the medical community is that these children are going to suffer deep deep trauma and you see it when you talk to them you, you know one mother told me the four-year-old boy they finally got the four-year-old boy back because of the lawsuit just keeps keeps asking are they going to take me away again in the middle of the night are they going to take me away again you know and and the parents are also traumatized beyond belief because they are feeling so guilty about what happened. And the dynamic between the mother or a father and the child has been so distorted. When the child comes back, they understandably cannot believe their parents let this happen. So they just constantly say, didn't you love me enough to stop them from taking you? Why didn't you stop them? Because at that age, they think of their parents as all powerful. I mean, that's the only reason a four, five, six-year-old doesn't fear everything in the world is because they think their parents can protect them. And once that's shattered, and so they're coming back and so resentful of their parents. And some of the kids who were too young, when they're five months, six months old, they're coming back and don't even recognize their parents. So the parents now are feeling so traumatized. So we as well as other groups are doing our best to bring lawsuits and try and get them monies to, to get trauma relief whether you know we can do that will it'll be be i think a real question it's going to be hard in the courts whether we can get that done but a lot of doctors and social workers and other people have stepped up to do pro bono work but I, but i think what the medical community has said is that some of this trauma may be permanent so in some ways the brain structure has been changed. I mean, one doctor at Harvard, Dr. Sean Coleman, maybe people know here, has said, you know, think of it this way. What the child is experiencing is, think as an adult of the 15 minutes in your life that has been the most anxious, where you are the mo like acute anxiety and fear. Those 15 minutes, imagine those 15 minutes going on for six months and then imagine you're a child who has no capacity to process that. That's what it's like for these children, literally every second, the fear they're experiencing, not knowing where their parents are. Um, you know, and, and so it, it's been really depressing. And I, I just want to end on two notes, one of which is hopefully less depressing, is that I think the silver lining in all of this has been that the Trump administration was counting on the public having gone to sleep. There was that huge burst after the Muslim ban, and then it sort of died down. And I think they were assuming they could do this without creating public outrage. And what we saw, fortunately, was outrage from the public. Probably, it's probably the biggest civil, closest to a civil rights moment I've seen in my career at the ACLU. You know, something paralleling that the civil rights, not the movement of the 60s, not as big, obviously, but the closest I've seen. And it wasn't just liberals and Democrats. It was conservatives and Republicans. It was Laura Bush writing an op-ed in the Washington Post saying, look, 
I was married to a Republican president. There's a lot of different views on immigration policy, but at some point, the United States just needs to stand up. We don't do this in the United States. We don't take little babies away. The Pope came out forcefully. Conservative religious leaders began to come out. Obviously, you know, the general public, there were protests all the time, and I think that was critical. It's died down. I don't think people, you know, and it's understandable. I think we should talk about this. How do you keep the attention on any issue when there are so many issues? There's so many issues just in the immigration area, so many issues just with children. There's so many areas just in civil rights. And then there's, right, I mean, today is wall-to-wall -wall impeachment coverage, you, you know? And so, and people have their own lives to lead, and how do you keep the focus on it? But we fortunately were able to get that public outcry, and it was critical. I think it was critical in the court case, and it, it also pushed the administration to back. Um, they obviously didn't back down completely, but they were no longer out there sort of forcefully saying this is a fine policy. The other thing I wanted to just say, since there's a lot of young people in the audience, and maybe this is relevant for us older folks, but, you know, one of the things I fear is that there's so much going on and the problems are so big that there is a tendency for people to say, well, I'm probably not going to be the person who brings that enormous lawsuit or starts that advocacy campaign. And so I probably won't make a dent, and therefore there's not really anything to do, or the problems are so big they're not really solvable. I, I would just say that try and help one person. You know, if that's all you can do, help one person. And it can be the smallest thing. It could be making sure one of these separated kids or any immigrant kid or any kid has a backpack or if you're a social worker, you're going to work with one kid, or you're going to tutor one kid. You know, it's just it's those, you'll see the gratification, and it can't be that you say, I'm going to either solve all the biggest problems, or I'm not going to do anything. I, you know, a few months ago, I was in Tijuana with a, a father and son. The son is now 10. He was 9 when he was separated, and they were separated for five months. And the father was telling me this story. They were from Guatemala, and they had made it back to Tijuana and they were reunited now. And he was, they were telling me the harrowing story of the separation. And the little boy was just listening very quietly and the father finished and he walked away. And the little boy, I could see him sort of summoning up his courage, came over to me, stood up and put out his hand to shake my hand and said, you know, please keep helping my family, thank you, right? So those are the kind of moments I remember probably far longer than I'll remember arguing in the Supreme Court or testifying before Congress. So I would really urge people, because I think it's a real danger, and I see it all the time when things get this bad, to feel like it's just overwhelming. But to take those little steps um, are really worthwhile. And I think, you know, you all probably, a lot of you are working on big issues, and that's great. But I think to the extent you have friends, encourage people, just do one little thing, or do one little thing on top of sort of the big policy work you're doing or whatever other work you're doing is important. So maybe I'll just stop there. And Thank you very much, Lee. Um, I'm only going to ask you one question because I'm sure um, there's a, a lot of questions out there. Um, but I want to ask you a question about the ongoing separation. How is it possible, given, as you said, this kind of bipartisan revulsion against the family separation policy, <coughs> which was very gratifying? I mean, uh, that you had Republicans, you actually ha kind of, they were caught, I think, off guard nearly, that there was, they couldn't get away with this. How are they now getting away with this? How is it now possible that for, you know, having, I mean, there are all sorts of things that are being used of this. Yeah. As you say, there's the, the fact that people have minor criminal convictions, which criminal convictions which have absolutely nothing to do with their child caring capacities. There's the fact that people may not be parents, but they may be other types of relatives right. that justify separation. The, you know, the result is that you still have over a thousand people and maybe more at this point uh, who are separated. How, I mean, just yeah. how is that possible politically given, uh, you know, the fact that they were forced to, um, to, to, to reverse course last time. I just right. would like so to understand that, that's that better. That's a very good question. And um, I think it's a challenge for us figuring out 
how to put it back on the map. But I think one of the things we're running into in this climate is the minute you talk about a criminal issue, people say, you know, we're, what we're seeing from a lot of congressional folks is, oh, well, well, you know, we can't get involved. There's some, there's some reason to separate, I guess, and we need to give the government some deference, and maybe some are serious, maybe some are minor, but it's just, I think there's, it's a combination, and I think this is something we should talk about, and we'd love to hear from you as well, how to keep things on the map. So I think it's a problem of people maybe now moving on to other issues, and I also think there's some emotional burnout. People just can't hear about another one-year-old who's separated, so there's a little bit of that. But I also think in this climate, anytime you say, if someone has a criminal conviction, they're not pristine. People start to tune out, and that's been the challenge for us to say, yeah, we're not putting them up for Parent of the Year award if they have three thefts or Person of the Year, but you don't take the child away. And so how to get that message across, I, I just, um, I, I think that's the, the real challenge. And we're actually hitting some resistance in the court of, well, doesn't the government need some deference? and they have to make these split-second decisions. So it, it's been a whole difficult thing. But yeah, it's been a shocker that there's been 1,100 separations since the, and, and I think that's what we're struggling with, is how to put it back on the map and how to explain to people, look, a lot of people have a disorderly conduct violation in the United States who don't come and take their child away. But it's the right question, and I don't have an easy answer for you. I mean, I suppose the other related issue is, um, you know, the de detention conditions of the unaccompanied children, of which there are right. many more than a thousand. And, you know, again, this has been before Congress. There was a very compelling testimony about, you know, children being filthy, children not having enough to eat, children, very young children being, you know, not properly cared for. I mean, there's a kind of a, there's a a degradation in in the response of the state, which is really, I mean, it's like nearly the shock value has nearly gone out of it. It's something so egregious. Yeah, where that's an important point, and I think it's something we should also all talk about is the shock value. I mean, at some point, there's so many things being done, and this is something we talk about all the time at the ACLU. There's so many things being done that how that people shock value and. It's just one after another, and how to keep the outrage there, and how to decide, well, what are we gonna push? There's so many different things. And the other part of it is that there's the narrative from the administration about people invading the country and how many migrants are coming. That is the narrative we're pushing back on. And so we wanna fight a lot of these policies but one of the things that I've said, but which is tricky, is you know, wherever you might be on macro immigration policy, you have to take the Laura Bush position that you cannot separate children. You cannot have them without toothpaste and soap. You cannot indefinitely detain them. But it's getting lost in this larger narrative the administration's putting out. It's very difficult to figure out sort of how to keep things on the map and also be doing the other issues that are not children's issues because we we feel like we broke through with the children but on the other end you know the ACO is not focused solely on children and so we are advocating on a lot of different issues and it becomes very very tricky and I, I think you know what I always tell people is the court cases are extremely difficult but combating the public narrative I think is probably more important and trickier because for a lot of people, the border is just sort of sight unseen. They just don't, and it's just not their worry. I think it got through to people when the children were being separated and they could, ProPublica released a tape of the children just crying and screaming, where are my parents, where, you know, mommy, daddy. But otherwise, immigration is a tough issue and how to keep it on the front burner and how to push back on the narrative that we're being invaded and families are just coming here and bringing their children to try and get an easier road. I, I, you know, I welcome this discussion with people here and the more fresh perspectives we can get because I think that's where we are is this, there's just so many issues. I mean, even within the ACLU, right, 
we do every, unlike other civil rights groups, we do basically every issue under the sun. And so even within the ACLU, you walk into our communications department and we say, look what Trump just did this week on immigration and here are three things that should be outrageous to everyone. And then someone else walks in and says, you're not gonna believe what he just did on this, on <laughs> you know, and this and this and this sort of how to keep it all out there and what to focus on is I think that that's been and I think that's part of what the administration's doing. They're just doing so many things that as you put it, you know, sort of the outrage is and you know the shock value is going out of it almost so susan and then we'll open it up to the to the public susan do you think it would have made any difference if the if the us had ratified the crc and if you know there was a committee on the rights of the child that actually could have come and inspected and would it have made a difference do you think do you think it would have been a powerful um tool, I mean, I, you can't say would it have stopped this, but would it have actually, what difference do you think it would have made? Um, I don't know so much about the, I mean, I'm, I'm not so convinced that it would be the convention, but I think that there wasn't enough international outrage, and there are mechanisms of the UN that could have been used, special rapporteurs, special representatives. I was even kind of annoyed at UNICEF, but I understood, and this is not new, just to say, uh, when all of this really started to heat up in 2012, we tried to put a statement out of UNICEF headquarters. And because the organization is very much dependent on untied US government resources, no statement came out. Um, and uh, so a, a lot more could have been done, I think, to publicly, sorry guys, I mean, but shame the US. And I don't think, you know, and then, you know, I, I really think you're making a brilliant point because, you know, we are all outraged about Syria when we saw the picture of the dead baby on the beach. And then, like, a month later, we've moved on to the next thing. And I, I, I just, uh, I, I don't have an answer to your question either, but I would say that the toxic narrative has to be challenged by, in part, this is not the answer, but the positive stories about what happens to people who have come here. And there are right. endless stories. Right. And I'm working with a filmmaker right now, an American, who's doing a five-part series on this and trying to, and we want to get the US segment out quick while all this discussion's going on. I, I just want to say one little thing on the back of what you said about doing something at a personal level. I think that's really very true. But I also think you, you guys all have, young and old, the opportunity to vote. And I, I you know, something's got to change in the narrative and the discussion and so on, and I, that's got to be a way, too. There's got to be some political action, I think. But anyway, it's not the answer. Thank you. Well, thank you both. That was really wonderful. So let's uh, open it up. Could anybody who wants to ask a question uh, raise their hand and uh, introduce yourself and ask a brief question? Who wants to start? Yeah. Thank you. My name is Ingrid Guzman. I'm a full rights scholar, and I'm originally from Romania. And I've actually um, my PhD thesis looked at how uh, the provision of children's rights has changed in Romania as part of the EU obsession. Uh, my question to um, uh, Susan is linked to the cultural shift that the CRC involves. So the way we think about children, you know, as being agents with rights. Uh, has that actually occurred over the last 30 years? I mean, on a global level, in Europe, uh, have we changed the way we think about children, especially when acting in justice, in education, because we still have you know, uh, violations of children's rights. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think there's a, well, I would say on, at the macro level, yes, um, that, that there has been, um, there have been changes uh, in seeing children as holders of rights. Um, and I think if you look at the big data, and, and uh, Hans Rosling's son has done a really good job of, uh, of pulling some of this stuff together. Um, so, you, you know, it, yes, things have improved. Now, does that mean we see children as rights holders? Not necessarily, because a lot of that is service delivery. But there are, are many, many examples at the global level. I'll give you one, which is um, guidelines on children deprived of liberty. 
um, you know, these are these are new. They're guidelines. They're not binding, and they're not a treaty. But, um, for example, those are being used in many countries around the world. Um, the whole issue of migration, detention, and children. Um, the standards are all really good there now, and they have resulted, I think, from the the, the convention. But there are also many examples, and I. I could imagine where you were going with Romania. I mean, there have been a lot of positive uh, developments in Romania around children in institutions and intercountry adoption and children living with disabilities. Um, are they 100% changed? No. And I, I think the Swedish example shows us that we are talking about generation and generation and generation of change. And the fear I have right now, um, and it's linked to the migration issue and the unaccompanied minors and that toxic narrative is, you know, uh, it's, I would say that adolescents in particular, but older children aren't necessarily seen as an asset or a strength in, in societies and communities, and, and especially, and this is not me talking, but the, perception, the perceptions of them um, are quite negative, and I think that's not helping our, our cause very much. Um, but I would, yeah, it depends on what day of the week you talk to me, but I think there've been a, you know, a, a lot of good changes in culture and attitudes toward kids, but we've got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Christina. is accountability. You have the right to move, to, to transit through a country to seek asylum and protection. You're transiting through Mexico. Mexico is accountable to protect your rights. You reach the United States, you seek asylum. The United States is accountable to provide your rights. You go back and remain in Mexico. Who's accountable? Who should protect you? You have already seek as seeked asylum in the United States and you're in the process. And then they're pushing you to another country. The, the other country already said, well, you're here. And what's happening right now with children and with very vulnerable populations is that they're even at greater risk because they cannot ask for services because they don't want to in a way jeopardize their asylum seeking in the United States. Right. They remain in, in Tijuana. So, so the question for you is that, who is accountable and how can we fight for that accountability? So you didn't get a chance to talk about the yeah. migrant protection so, protocols, so maybe say a little bit about that right. as in the answer so to the question. Thank you. I'm just going to give everyone else a sense of what you're talking about and then, yeah. So the government now has a few new asylum policies, all of which the ACLU is challenging in court at different stages. And so there's been two asylum bans and one... MPP policy remain in Mexico. The first asylum ban, which we have gotten and joined, um, and will probably end up in the Supreme Court fairly soon, is that you can't apply for asylum if you enter between ports of entry, if you enter illegally. And this just, I just want to make a quick point about that before I, you know, this goes to sort of how big a bully public the administration has. And that narrative, you know, we all may know why forcing people to go to a port of entry and not allowing them to apply for asylum if they enter illegally is, is wrong. But the narrative is pretty common sense and reaches a lot of people at an intuitive level, right? Hey, we're not saying you can't apply for asylum, but just go and apply legally. Go to a port of entry and fine, you can apply for asylum. And you know, the president reaches a lot of people very quickly and that's an easy sound bite and it seems intuitively right. And for us to combat it at, at a narrative level means we need to get the facts out. The president tweets it out and gets on the air and you know, 20, 30 million people quickly hear it. But for us to get the facts out to counter it means we need to get on national television constantly. And so the facts we would get out are Congress has looked at this issue and for 40 years has said, it doesn't matter where you enter because sometimes you're a asylum seeker you're fleeing for your life and you cross wherever you can cross. Sometimes there's criminal organizations forcing you to cross at a particular place. Sometimes people don't know where the port of entry is. Sometimes they know, but it's 200 miles away and they're not gonna walk there with a three-year-old. And on top of that, the administration's not actually letting you apply at a port of entry. They're doing what's called metering, where they make you wait in Mexico for months and months on a list. And they but in the meantime, the families and children are waiting there 
in dangerous squalid conditions. Then they have a second asylum ban, which we're also challenging, which says if you transit through any country on the way to the U.S., you can't apply for asylum in the U.S., which also goes against what Congress is saying. And again, the sound bite seems easy, right? Well, why shouldn't these other countries share the burden? If you're really in danger, apply for asylum in the first country you get to. But what they leave out, of course, are the facts that the countries you pass through, Guatemala and Mexico, don't have functioning asylum systems. They can't handle people applying for asylum. And it's too dangerous to wait for a decision in those countries. But that's not something that gets out there so easy. What you're talking about is the, the third policy they have, which is called Remain in Mexico, which you reach a US border, and they say, OK, you can apply for asylum. We're not going to put you on any list, but we're going to tell you to remain. We're going to put you back in Mexico, you remain in Mexico. And then when we call your case, you'll come back. So it's a little like the list thing, but this more formalized and it's national. But as you point out, what's happening is that these families, it's some adults, but also lots and lots of families with small children, are being sent to places in Mexico where they have nowhere to live. It's extremely dangerous. They're just sitting ducks for cartels, and especially the children. So it's an horrendous situation. And your question's a good one. Well, so who's accountable? Mexico didn't kick them out. They could have tried to apply for asylum in Mexico, but it would have been probably futile because of the way the Mexican asylum system is functioning and how dangerous it is. So they get to the US, and then what the US does is give you this little hearing that we're challenging because it's barely anything that tries to see whether you would be persecuted by Mexico themselves. And they always conclude pretty much that Mexico it's, itself will not persecute you. But what they don't take into account are whether the cartels are gonna be just picking you off if the minute you walk out of a shelter or whether you have anywhere to live or whether you can get a job or whether you can get food. Mexico doesn't want it, but they've been forced into accepting the policy. There are parts of the Mexican society that are trying to help, but they don't have the capacity even if they were fully on board to try and help. The US washes their hands of what happens to you in Mexico as long as it's not the Mexican government itself that's persecuting you. And so the truth is, no one is really now accountable for these people. Mexico is not saying we're washing our hands, but they just don't have the capacity, and they got forced into this policy. And the US is washing their hands, and the real goal is for people never to actually come back for their hearing, to just give up when they're in Mexico and leave. And so it's a horrendous situation where we expect a decision any day now from the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit on the legality of it. We're hopeful we'll win. But then I think with the Trump administration's MO is to bring everything to the U.S. Supreme Court. And then I think, you know, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Yeah, Susan yeah. And there was a recent um, UC San Diego study interviewing 600 asylum seekers in Mexico in which it said, like, in that initial interview, they weren't even asked if they were in danger in Mexico. That right. Like so people don't even know they're going to be sent back to Mexico. They mm -hmm. think, well, we've reached U.S. soil. Now we're going to be protected. Mm -hmm. And then they're sent back to Mexico. And the government says, well, they could have told us they might fear being in Mexico. But they have no idea. They're not told and not asked. They're or not asked. They're not Mexico. even asked whether you fear going to Mexico. And so they have no reason to blurt that out because what they're telling the people at the, at the officers is we fear where we came from, which yes. is not Mexico. So they have no reason to even mention Mexico. And then all of a sudden they find themselves in Mexico. And the government's saying, well, they never told us they feared going to Mexico. But of course, they weren't asked that. And they had no reason to believe that's where they were going to end up. So that's one of the other things we're saying. Even if you're allowed to send people to Mexico, you have to have a, a fair hearing. But I don't think it's going to ultimately fix the problem you're identifying, which is if you have a genuine claim against the Mexican government for persecution, that may be taken into account or supposed to be taken into account by the US government. But they're not taking into account that cartels are going to pick you off or you may not have anywhere to sleep or anywhere to, way to get food or anything like that. And just to say that tomorrow, um, FXB is having a work in uh, progress lecture by Sergio Aguaro, who's going to be talking about organized crime, um, migrants, and human rights in Central and uh, right. America. So very relevant. Yeah. Um, 
Are there any other? Really, uh, we should be wrapping up, I think. But could I ask just one? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thanks. So, thank you for really an incredibly um, stimulating evening and, and one that's quite wrenching, actually. Uh, what I wonder is, uh, since we're here marking 30 years, if, I, I don't know from whom this would, should be directed, but if the U.S. were signatory to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, would there be another court uh, in which these claims could be heard? Uh, that speaks to the question of what difference does it make that the U.S. is not signatory? Right. But I think you'd have to exhaust domestically, no? Yeah, yeah. you would. But, but what you would have is, and I think where you were coming from, I think, earlier too, Jackie, is, um, I mean, you'd, you'd have a platform. Um, you'd right. certainly get the Committee on the Rights of the Child. You'd get the mechanisms of the UN active as advocates, for sure. Legal, mm, as long as you guys are doing the great work you're doing, I don't think um, um, it would get very far. Yeah, I mean, I I'm think, just thinking yeah. of, I mean, at least in the Civil Rights Movement, right. for example, the, court, the international uh, community played a very important role. Yeah. So uh, that, on that point, it was, yeah. It was, you know, this was in the midst of the Cold War. Here was the U.S., the beacon of democracy. Right. Was I think Russia Susan was speaking to that, and I think you're right about yeah. that. I think whether we would have a legal mechanism that would be effective beyond what the U.S. courts would give us, getting the international community to speak out and yeah. involved, I think, is critical. I think that was, you know, your point. I think part of for us is we were, I mean, this is no excuse, but I think we were drowning, and so I don't know that we had the resources to be getting to, you know, sort of getting the international community involved, but I think that is something, and that we're trying to do more than they see you, that we need to make a sort of a worldwide event when it warrants it, and I think this... Would I, I think this is a really critical point, because I think that um, because of U.S. exceptionalism, Somehow, the re and because things are so bad here, the rest of the world has sort of washed its hands to some extent. I mean, I think that you could imagine a situation in which there would be a boycott. And people will say, you know, we're not going to do X or Y with the US. We're not going to buy X or Y products of the US because this is absolutely unconscionable, you know. And the EU should, or, you know, member states of the EU should be passing resolutions. They should be organizing and there should be mass demonstrations. Now, the fact that the EU, that, that the, you know, the U.S. has kind of absented itself from that international arena will, willfully, I think has kind of provided a certain sort of shield, not a justified shield, but it has provided a shield. It has kind of dampened the, the, the level of out, outrage. And this is not to suggest that European countries are, are doing well on this front. They aren't. But this level of, of you know, of willful cruelty, as you say, daily willful Cruelty, I think, is is a different uh, a different order of 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 abuse, and I think that is something which is very regrettable. I mean, I just wonder, Leon. You know, I think we all admire so much the work that you guys are doing, and and against such odds, you know. But the public, you know, there was the early period, the first six months, eight months, many of us were kind of like a demonstration every weekend. It was kind of back to the old days sort of feeling, and now I think that's just. There is this, maybe we're all hoping for the election, or maybe everybody is just exhausted, I don't know, but there is this sense of a dramatic shift in the level of acti activism, um, that people are kind of like in this, in this real sense of, of impotence, I think. And I mean, I think your point is a very valid one that, you know, every act of kindness, every act of generosity is important. But I think there is this bigger political dimension oh, where, yeah, sure. which, is, which is our responsibility. Not, you guys are doing your job brilliantly, but the rest of us are not really. I mean, somehow. Yeah, anyway. yeah and I didn't mean them to be mutually exclusive. I, I feel not. like those huge public yeah. events have to happen. And those, you know, and I, I think that's something we struggle with every day is how do we keep that going, but I, I just meant also I think little individual acts are, are important because I do feel sometimes people can feel like this is just too much and no, I'm you're not right. going to dip my toe in them. Yeah, Jenny, you had your hand up.
people across Boston and university economics and university committees together, you know, to really think about how we can bring and coordinate some of the work that's happening. And we also have an issue brief which is available on our, on our immigration initiatives at Harvard that will be website by Jack Shonkov, who you mentioned, which is on toxic stress mm -hmm. and the effects right. of family separation in the border. So um, I just wanted to flag that. And, and Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. I saw another hand up. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is, is Desi. And um, I was wondering as far as like historical context, I'm talking about family separation mm -hmm. and I guess kind of migration at large. But when, this is like a very productive way, I guess, of asking about this, but when the US plays a role like economically into the turmoil of other countries um, from investing in wars, mm -hmm. from leading into economic, um, economic issues in other countries, like ultimately lead to the reality with immigration today. How is that, like where is our responsibility there and how is that narrative at all brought when like going to court with these cases or how does, how does that play um, into, I guess, where you guys are today? Yeah, um, so I would, I guess I'd answer in two ways. One is, you know, I don't know if there are lawyers here or the court is pretty narrow you know, the court cases are pretty narrow, and you start talking about well, the U.S.'s responsibility, that the origins of all these problems doesn't really float in court. And so it's not something we say in court. You know, court is not that creative, and you need to sort of stick to the law and all that. But I do think your point is, is well taken, is that that has to be even more of the narrative, the public narrative, where we responsibility and I don't know that there's been you know there's been some of that but where there's there has been a sort of more narrow concrete focus that people get on board with is that we have stopped giving the Trump administration has stopped giving aid to the Northern Triangle and so <coughs> what do they expect to happen and some people say they expect people to come here and that's what they want because it's the more people that come, the more it's a political wedge issue. Because one of the interesting things is when I testified with Dr. Shankoff in Congress about family separation, you know, it was one of the few immigration issues ever where it wasn't bipartisan and I didn't have Republicans screaming at me. Most of the people were outraged by it, even Republicans, but even the sort of more hardcore Republicans what they did is use their time to actually say we need to give more aid to the Northern Triangle, which was a very interesting aspect and say, I think, you know, where they were sort of breaking from the administration. But, you, you know, I think you're right, and I think people recognize that, but when you're sort of framing public debate and getting people on board, if that's what you're going to be talking about, I mean, we were always sort of balancing those kinds of truisms with how are you going to get the most people on board? And if that's what you're talking about is Laura Bush signing on to that message, you know, it's, it's a very tricky dynamic, I, I think, from a, from a communication standpoint, putting aside what you're saying about how much the U.S. is actually responsible for various migration flows and various problems in different countries. Yeah, Susan. I just wanted to say I think you've touched on that a good point from another perspective with respect to the Northern Triangle. Historically, the USAID money that's gone into those three countries in particular was, it has been for law enforcement and border control. And CDC, so CARSI in USAID. And uh, CDC managed to convince USAID before this administration came into power to shift some of those resources to better understand the sources of violence, what's going on in these families and communities. And one conversation that is repeatedly missing is drug consumption in the United States mm -hmm. and the links between drug consumption here and what's going on in the Northern Triangle. And I miss that completely. And it's a huge one that needs to be had and maybe we have to wait for the next administration to, but anyway, right, the, ca right. the underlying causality stuff is completely missing and, and the wrong approach by USAID historically. Yeah, Natalia. Hi, my name is Natalia Lienas. I'm with the Headspace Center. My question to you, Lee, is about if you could think in the next three to five years what cases you might want to bring, what sort of data could we be helping collect? Is it, for example, following some of these families that are reunited who might claim some financial, like is there anything that the medical public health community can be 
doing in terms of research? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think one of the things that's been so critical in our fight in the family separation has been the medical community coming out so forcefully. And I think you're exactly right now. The question is sort of thinking creatively. If the family separation practice stops, we have a new administration. You know, sort of how to use the medical community in creative ways, not just as stop gaps to to to, to push back on on horrendous policies. But I, I think that you know one of the things is definitely to monitor the families that have been separated. To actually, I mean, I think there's concrete reasons for that because we're going to be in court and we're going to say this is the damages that occurred. But I think also just to be, I think historically we need to tell the story of family separation in its fullest, and that includes what's happened to these children going forward. But I also think there's probably going to be other more subtle things we can do. I mean, one of the things that I think is getting lost is everyone's focusing on the numbers of people who are put into deportation proceedings. But the other thing that's really happening throughout immigrant communities is the toxic stress of just fearing that you're going to get picked up. Now that local police are involved and the administration is encouraging local, just constantly worrying about getting picked up. It might, might come when the child comes from a school, are the parents still going to be there and vice versa? And I, I wonder, you know, sort of whether we need better information, better data about the stresses that are affecting the immigrant communities and how, you know, the ability of a child to focus in school if they're constantly worried that their parents are gonna be deported, those types of things. And I think we need to try and figure out and work with the medical community to come up with those types of, of plans, three to five year plans to, to really have that data so the next time we see things like this, we have that, you know, but it's a great question, and I think that's a dialogue that we should try and actually have yes, sooner rather than later. So you don't know of anyone who is following after you do the reunification. You don't know if you, of anyone who is doing the follow-up. Maybe that is something that. We yeah, I think there right may now. be some. I mean, I there. I think there's bits and pieces going on, but one of the things we're trying to do get a handle on, and and get some foundation help to try is figure out all the people who are looking at these issues, and I think you know. And I think Dr. Shankov would be one person to talk to about all that. But I, because I think there are people looking at various things, but how systematically it's being done and who's talking to who is something that would be important. And if you, you all are able to play a role, even a liaison role, mm -hmm. as well as doing some of the work. But I think w at some point we need to have a conference of bringing sort of people on the ground doing this work, the lawyers, with the medical community and have a real brainstorming session. What do we need? Who can do what? Who are the best people? And I think international so social Ex services too. Are exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, it would be great to you have invite people or even have two of them and one here and one, you know, wherever you thought was the best place to have that internationally. Yeah. Oh, well, that's that's definitely something we're going to mm -hmm. take away. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Go ahead. Uh, my name is This is, it's a very specific question, but under the general umbrella of children's agency. Um, so in conflict, uh, obviously children are often used in conflict as soldiers or in other areas, and as a result, whether they join of their own volition or whether they're trafficked or et cetera, um, they engage in horrific things. And so after the conflict, as adults are being and et cetera, what, what happens, where do we stand on children's actions taken in conflict? Um, are they to be held accountable for what they did? Or are, do we say that anyone under the age of 18 is a child and therefore doesn't know what they were doing? Or obviously there's a gray area of case by case. So what, international law says is under 18 you're a victim you're you're not a criminal um, and the, the the best illustration of this and it dragged on forever but but he came out on the right side was um, Omar Khadra you remember that case and that went on forever and I mean he was living in Canada um, so that that's the principle that's the law it doesn't always apply 
Um, I can give you endless examples, but that one was just so stark, um, considering how young he was when he was first exposed and, and I would argue dragged into it. But in answer to your question, that's, that's what international law says, but it doesn't always hold true. But as, so as child rights practitioners, do you feel, and I'm curious, I don't, I don't know, I've asked this question a bunch of times and have, have gotten different answers. Um, how do you feel that affects the agency of, the, of a person who might be 17 um, or 16 who would say that they were doing things of their own will? Um, well, there's a, a general principle in, in children's rights that you, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't self-exploit. You can't so under the age of eighteen. But I just, you're asking really good questions because there's reality. So I, I, I would yeah. jump in here and say this is an important question, and there is a very heated debate about this topic. So the principle is that no international court has sought fit to charge a child with atrocities, even when children have committed atrocities. That's very different from saying that there shouldn't be any process for uh, really giving some sort of responsibility and really addressing the responsibility that children have and the agency that children often have uh, in that extreme wrongdoing. So I think there is a sense, and I think it was in the UN too, there was, there was a real polarization within the human rights community, if you like. And on the one hand, there were organizations like Human Rights Watch who really argued that these children are victims, that these children have, did not really have agency, that they were coerced into situations of enormous brutality, and it would just be compounding their um, abuse to now put them through a judicial procedure or any other procedure which made them revisit the horrors which they, you know, to which they'd been exposed. On the other hand, there was a whole, and there is a quite a vibrant community of child rights um, advocates who argue that to really come to terms with those atrocities and to move on, you need to take responsibility. So our colleague, Martha Minow, who was former dean of Harvard Law School, has just written a book, and she has a chapter on exactly this topic, um, which Sam just photocopied for my class next year, um, uh, where she actually addresses this in a very um, robust way, saying, if you don't take responsibility, you can't really move on. And that this idea of exoneration and complete um, you know, protection of the young person may not be in their best interest, and it certainly may not be in the best interest of their societies. I know that in practice, what many communities have done is not to go the judicial route of you know, criminal culpability, but to have kind of cleansing rituals and other customary rituals, which are very powerful. So I know that in Angola, for example, there was this ritual where children returning to a community after having been complicit in very serious human rights offenses, I mean, you know, murders and, you know, in Sierra Leone, of course, famously children kind of cut off the wrist or the arm. Um, in, in, in Angola, what the, the kind of cleansing process was literally the child was naked and then covered in ash and then there was a process of the whole community coming around cleansing the child with some chants and other pr procedures very very powerful kind of psychic way of kind of rebirthing someone out of this kind of you know terrible set of of culpabilities so i think it's probably I think many of us were on the kind of children are innocent end of the spectrum. I think maybe that was simplistic. I would say, though, that I do think one thing that is to me very clear is that a child should not be excludable under the Refugee Convention, if you follow that, you know, under Article 1F. So a, a child who has been uh, involved in these sort of atrocities should not be excludable if they need to apply for asylum because that would really be to compound, I think, the suffering they've been through. So, I mean, but I think it is... It, 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 yeah, exactly. There's another book out of here that Cecile Aptel and um, I think Shadamini Segrist was involved in which they look at the Truth and Reconciliation Committees, which are along the lines of what you were proposing, yeah. not yeah. so much as cleansing, but as a sort of reconciliation oh, in the community. Right. Are there any other? Just while I'm looking at the case of Syria Leone, which Jackie mentioned, and the discussion about that 
quick time because the international work for work for work for at that time uh, about um, children in armed conflict basically said they shouldn't go to prison, but there should be some, some method process of, of accountability. Um, having said that, there's no longitudinal data on these kids, by the way. So another study, yeah. Yeah, any other questions? We're, we're, we're nearly running out of time, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so just taking this second one, that has been a concern of the ACLU for a long time and other advocates. And, you know, there have been immigration issues that obviously predate the Trump administration. And there were a lot of things the Obama administration did that we were not happy with. And I felt like, you know, that there were the t conditions in immigration detention have been bad for a long time. Um, and we've been concerned about it. And I think you've hit the on the head of the privatization of a lot of the detention centers is particularly troubling the conflict and the sort of for-profit motives. So that is definitely an issue that people are working on. On the first question, I am told that there has been nothing like this in other countries, the forcible separation of immigrant, you know, migrants and then their children. So, but I, you know, I think that's another thing that probably needs a more system. I mean, you may know right off the top of your head. I just, I don't know of anything like this. I mean, the one thing I haven't mentioned, which sort of remiss did not mention, is that there are a lot of people talking, which I think is right, about putting the family separation crisis now into a larger historical context in the U.S. that for African Americans experienced it. It's been a sort of mode of oppression. Native Americans, and then even right now, that over incarceration is a form of separating parents and children. You're putting a single parent in jail for a minor criminal offense, and they're being separated from their child de facto, but nonetheless separated. And so I think that sort of historical perspective is one that probably needs to be discussed more and more in the US. But outside the US, I am not really aware of direct parallels. I don't know if. Su Susan, you are? Well, I was going to use the example, actually, that you do with indigenous populations right. historically in Australia and Canada and, right. other, okay. and other places. Um, there's a lot of um, disaster and conflict-related family separation, not like this. But, but the, the one example I wanted to use is a live one right now, where there is a proposal um, from a former senior, like former US ambassador in the Middle East to forcibly separate and for the right reasons, so I'm not, I'm not saying that with the critical lens, although I am critical, but it, to force, forcibly separate the under five-year-olds from their mothers in, the, in Kurdish-controlled Syria, um, and that is because there is radicalization and they've already separated, the 12-year-olds the are already separated and in a, another prison or camp, if you will, but it's a prison. Um, so this, there is a practice, and I think it's, it would be a good subject for yeah. research. Yeah, I mean, but, but people, I don't know, I mean, it, it's definitely this sort of deliberate separating the parent and the child, you know, outside of a conflict area, I don't know mm -mm. how many, I, I am not aware of sort of direct parallels, which is amazing that in this day and age in the U.S. that that's what it... I, I think there are historical precedents in a different context. So we were talking about this coming into the room. Right. So there is a long history of, you know, poor children being placed in institutions right. by parents who place them there in a temporary capacity. Right. And then the children either are adopted or indeed are shipped out. So there was a, a program which lasted for about 150 years right. in, the U, in the U.K. Um, which really shipped out these 
poor white children from St. Bernardo's homes and other institutions to people the colonies with white stock. That was the idea. So they were sent to what was then Rhodesia. They were sent to Australia. They were sent to Canada. Very large numbers. And these were not orphans. These were poor children who'd been played, you know, poor mothers, single parents, whatever, had placed their children. And then, and they would, the, the children were never put in touch with their parents again. It's a kind of a different thing. Yeah. But I think this actual willful separation at the border, when you have a, a loving parent holding the child, the hand of a small child to separate them in that way, that I think is, is pretty unprecedented. Yeah. yeah. 